Today on Dead Dodge Garage, I made Dave scrape Bondo off the roof of a 64 power wagon. Well, it's still on the trailer somehow. It looks kind of good. Last licensed in 1996. It does kind of look like it lost a fight. You guys ever heard of bodywork? Oh, it's raining rust. Okay, gonna take a little bit more than that. On a scale of one to not great, here's where we're at. Craig, uh, well, it didn't turn my hand, but we're getting places. So maybe we do have a show. Man, it's beautiful. If you squint really hard, from about 30 feet back, Spring has finally come to the Pacific Northwest. Kind of nice. The sun is shining. Kind of. The birds are chirping. The broken Chevys are all around. Even better than that, we've got this thing, which unfortunately no one stole in the night. Mmm, maple bar. I've decided this thing looks kind of okay. It's cool, but it's very well beaten. Nah, it's not important at this particular juncture. I just need it off of Tyler's trailer. I'd hate to outstay my welcome, you know. That long tie rod sleeve was bent and actually rubbing on the axle, so I thought, hey, I'll just unbend it with the winch line. Yeah, I kind of unbent it too well. I wish these tires weren't six billion years old. They're cool. Unfortunately, I've just realized that these are actually lock ring rims, so that sucks. Ah, it's a little jackknifing among friends. I do wish the yard was like 10 feet wider. Oh, apparently this is how you do this. Oh yeah. Bunch the winch wire up. It's all super good. Say a prayer and let it rip. I guess if the wire falls off, it'll run into Colin Chevy. That'll be fine. Okay. Oh, yeah. Nothing to it. Everything is awesome. Everything is not awesome. I had to put the camera down and go full send with the winch, and I made it all the way to Earth, so that's great. The Dodge Garage. Not just a YouTube channel, but a way of life. As you may or may not know, I'm a big fan of power wagons. In fact, they tend to just congregate around here. There's one, oh, there's one. Of course, we can't forget that. In fact, right now on the property, I have almost every type of power wagon that was ever made, except for the late 50s one and a modern 20 teens or whatever. But I've never had a 60s swept line power wagon. I almost did once, twice actually, same truck. Mistakes were made. I'm pretty excited to get this thing operational and see what it can do it just so happens i have been collecting swept line stuff like this entire perfectly good not smashed cab so well we might need this but we'll see i do really like the color of this thing and i feel like i could fix a lot of what's wrong with it with like my size 10 boot and a hammer i've even got a nice grill just hanging around waiting for this truck it's almost like i planned it this way although i did have a painted one where'd that go as it happens, I've even got an entire extra spare core poly engine here for parts if need be. And a four speed. Confidence the wrong word, but I am pretty sure I can get that one in there to make smoke for us. With a little time, which is something I'm lacking right at the moment, so. Cut to some unknown point in the future when we're doing that. Lovely, it rained just enough to make everything wet and the demons damp. Anyway, 1964 Dodge Power Wagon, the ultimate off-roader. Kind of. This is actually an eight lug, three quarter ton, 200 model, which is cool. That means it has heavier springs than a 100, eight lug wheels, and a Dana 60 rear axle. The front is a Dana 44. Perhaps the best part of the setup is this divorce transfer case. Of course, under the hood here, we've got a Poly 318. So that's cool, but it needs some love. And in between the Poly and the divorce case, we've got some kind of four speed. 
It might be an MP435, but again, I'm not totally sure on that. It might be a 420 or something. Back to the poly needing help. Obviously some critters have been here, so a vacuum is gonna be one of the next steps. Pretty much everything on this engine that's supposed to move doesn't. So I'm gonna hit it with a liberal helping of lubricating magic. Hmm. Should probably get some gloves. My friend Nick with Lamvinci's Garage is kind of the swept line guy in these parts. In fact, I fully anticipated being in competition with him for the purchase of this fine vehicle. In a recent post, Nick says that number eight is always the cylinder to be seized in these things. So I'm gonna pull that plug and look there first. I have a lot of other things I should probably be doing right now. Like a lot. I just wanna hear this thing run. Oh look, it's the cavalry. Would you bring an invisible sandwich? Well, there's definitely some moisture. Well, it doesn't look amazing in there, but it's not a total rust factory. I'm gonna see if I can get some magic red cotton candy death in there. That piston's actually up pretty high, so it's not gonna take very much. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, okay, okay, all right. Should have quit while I was ahead, I guess. It sucks, but it's all I got. Think that's enough? Ow! Yeah, no further yet! <laughs> Backwards! Ow! Better just... Get to pulling all the rest of them. I pulled all the spark plugs. Of course, you already saw this one. A little bit of moisture in there. Uh, number six seems to be a bit of an oil burner. This is weird. Numbers three and four both have small engine plugs. I don't know what to think about that. And here's two. Um, probably also an oil burner, but not too bad. Number one. Yep, oil burner. Number three, small engine plug. Looks pretty good. Number five, bit of moisture and really rich. And number seven, do you think there was water in there? So I gave five and seven the marble treatment and um, we'll just wait a while, I guess. I would go all out with the marble and all of those cylinders, but unfortunately I'm running low and I might need this. Damn thing's coming around now. We got a choke. Kind of feels like it's just binding solid. And the starter's making weird noises, so I'm gonna pull that out and see if that changes anything. Junk. You know these are some of the best trucks to work on? For one reason, and one reason only. Okay, two reasons. They also have built-in workbenches. Do you guys know these three-bolt starters are heavy? Anyway, it's out and no, that's not the problem. Train. All right, for science, let's see if the starter's any good. Didn't want to do anything in there, but I can't say that's entirely surprising. Woo! Solenoid's a yes. I think this might actually be a valve rusted solid. It just doesn't feel normal. So, I want to look, but first, I need to remove all the crap off the top of the engine because I don't want it going under the valve covers.
Yeah, pretty much restored to factory specifications now. That side came off minty. Looks good. But uh, over here, things are a little different. Oh, that's bouncing. 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 Hmm. Okay, well, I think it's that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, actually, it's not the valve. It's just the arm. The valve returns. So that's cool. More hammering. A little bit of screwing around and it's restored. Well, it's another day later and uh, this thing's still locked up solid. So I guess the next thing I need to do is get some more marble and brim every one of these cylinders and then say a prayer. And if that doesn't work, we'll go for plan B. B as in Boy, I do not want to do plan B, because it's pulling the cylinder heads. I could scare up a camera to try and shove down the spark plug holes and figure out which cylinder it is. And then that'll tell me that I need to pull the heads anyway, so... We'll probably just cut to the chase and do that. It's not a big deal on the poly, really. Uh, I might try to find an exhaust manifold while I'm at it. But only if I can get the engine to rotate. Oh yeah, look at this crazy electronic ignition module. The matching distributor's gone and it's been swapped back to points. It's interesting. Well, the good news is I don't have to worry about draining the coolant. The bad news is I don't know if that's actually good news. Mmm, sugar. Today is like a bunch of tomorrows. So we're going to check in on the power wagon and see if the crank in the poly wants to rotate for us today. If not, well, might be time to get nasty. Before that, I feel like we should take a step back and admire the patina and figure out what the heck this truck is, because I think I forgot to do that. This 1964 Power Wagon is part of the third generation of the Power Wagon trucks. Longtime viewers will recognize this, my 1948 Dodge Power Wagon. This is a member of the first generation of Power Wagon truck. It's actually a member of the first series of the first generation of Power Wagon truck being a 48. Although since it's wearing the wrong bed, there aren't a whole lot of visual clues to tell you that. Based on the Chrysler factory built four wheel drive, medium duty pickups of World War II, the Power Wagon was a civilian version, the first mass produced civilian four wheel drive truck. It's stout, it's rugged, it's very Spartan, utilitarian. Starting in the late fifties, Power Wagon could mean two things. One, this, the military style WM300, or a regular Dodge pickup, more modern, turned into a four-wheel drive truck, a W series. So to put it very simply, in these later years and later generation trucks, the words power wagon simply mean four-wheel drive. The bodies and other components are exactly the same as their two-wheel drive counterparts. This particular example, like, well, most of the vehicles that seem to end up here, has had a pretty hard life. According to the seller, it was used as a farm truck for many years. Now what's interesting is, obviously there was some body damage, and someone has already tried to fix and restore this truck. In fact, there's filler here under the cowl, and the doors, and obviously about 800 gallons of it was in the roof. This was the seller's grandpa's farm truck, and she and her husband had every intention of keeping it and fixing it up, but unfortunately, life happened. This truck is really, really rough. It kind of needs one of everything, but the longer I look at it, the more I love it. From the factory, this truck would have had a normal pickup bed. Obviously, that's long gone, replaced with this interesting flatbed. I'd really like to find the right bed for it, but that's going to be challenging for one very annoying reason. In 1965-ish, the Dodge extended the wheelbase on the long eight-foot bed pickups, so the rear axle moved from, you know, here to here. It's a minor change, but measurable enough that you can't interchange early and late swept line beds. So, while I could find three of these beds yesterday, can't find any early ones. If you happen to be in the Pacific Northwest and you have one of those early eight foot swept line beds, have your people call my people because I'd love to own that. Especially if it's this weird blue tealy color. Okay, back to what I was doing. <sighs> Come on. Oh. Yep, it's still here. There's a lot I want to say about the Poly 318 engine, but uh, 
I have a feeling this one's gonna run long, so we'll probably have to save that for another day. Basically, it's like an LA engine, but also kind of like a big block Chevrolet. Well, it's been about an hour and a half or two hours of fighting this thing and trying to get the crank to turn, and I don't even know how, but somehow I just made the radiator leak. If you know swept lines, you know the radiator mounting is special. It's swept line specific. If you follow the goings on around here closely enough, you already know I have a swept line radiator problem. I already had two and a half swept line trucks and no good radiators between them. I guess technically it's one and two halves, but anyway. It's not like I was expecting this one to be any good. Heck, I didn't even think there was coolant in it. So now I'm gonna have to pull this thing and try and make it hold coolant in because well, I need it to hold coolant in. Meanwhile, pulled the clutch guard and I've had various pry bars in here, plus pressure on a ratchet on the balancer bolt. And I have gotten it to turn farther, but not enough. What was that nuclear option? I guess I'm already draining the coolant, so we're getting there. I don't know what it is with swept lines and not having floors, but it's a recurring theme around here. It's pretty common for them to also not have rockers, door bottoms, or steps. To Dodge Garage, ruining things for no reason. For quite some time now, actually. I decided to get scientific and use the world's second cheapest Wi-Fi camera to try and see inside the bores here and figure out what I'm up against, but no luck, really. Uh, I did cover it in Marvel Mystery Royale a couple times. Meanwhile, the radiator drips away. Okay. You just think about your life. It's kind of a smell to this thing, you know? Someone suggested I should loosen the valve gear and see if the engine spun. <clears throat> so I did. And it didn't. But it was a nice idea. Well, now this is happening. Why do I always wear my nicest clothes on days like this? Well, I've got a third of the toolbox out here, and it's still not rotating. My hope for this operation is starting to dwindle. Yeah, yeah. Admire the two-piece exhaust manifold. I did already buy a new one. Someone else suggested that the timing chain could be rusted solid. Well, it's not rusted solid. In fact, it's very, very loose. I went and saw the Melvins last night, and as a result of that, I'm really sore and tired, so... I think pulling this other head is gonna be a future Jamie thing. I've had this thing for almost a month now, and I've tried several times to get the damn engine to turn over. This thing's becoming my white whale. Before you know it, it'll be another year, and it still won't run despite my best efforts. Here's the passenger side cylinder head. Don't worry about the broken exhaust hardware, that's normal. I am the target. That'll teach you! Well? Um, uh, nothing yet. Uh, yeah, so it's months later, and <laughs> the other head's off, thanks to Dave. We didn't see anything in there, so now I'm going to drain the oil and pull the oil pan off, and hopefully we find something in there that makes sense. Oh, also, uh, someone loosened the entire exhaust, and it's right in the way. The oil was slightly overfilled, but I think it's coolant from when the heads came off. I found the oil, uh, kind of. Still quite watery. Also, uh, there were chunks in there that I had to fish out with the screwdriver to get the oil to come out. Are you comfortable? Yeah, I'm actually fine right. As long as I'm not trying to put 100 pounds of torque on a ratchet, I'm fine. Huh, fair enough. Yeah, so nothing in here is super ideal. Oh look, a forged crank. So far, I'm not seeing anything scary. Other than the sludge. Yeah, there was some moisture in here. Shocking, I know. Admire that. Ancient oil filter. I've never even seen Jiffy Lube brand before. All right, well, the big ends wiggle on number one, and two, and three, and four, and six. But uh, the rear two and number five, not so much. I think we'll just start knocking pistons out and see where that gets us. Okay, here's a new one. Why is there just stuff falling out of the timing chain cover? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Ah, okay. I have many questions right now. Uh, all right. I don't think that's our problem, but it sure is interesting. Uh, 
I don't know how Dave got signed up to get all the antifreeze and grime in his face, but I'm liking it either way. <laughs> well, Dave's pulling rod caps and getting literally everything in his face for some reason. I'm looking at this, the rod bearing we just pulled off number five. Clevite 77 with a date code of March 1971. Not that you can see that. That means this engine was rebuilt when it wasn't even 10 years old yet. That's pretty cool. It's seen some stuff, but these actually look pretty good by my standards. I think they're standard size too. Just punch yourself right in the face, that's fine. Number five's knocked up and out of there. It moved freely, so that's not our problem. Also, somehow coolant was like dribbling into this engine, into the crankcase, for years. And I think all that debris that was coming down was like built up, crystallized coolant mess. There are trails back here too. And those trails match this really interesting staining on the oil pan. Yeah, kind of cool. Also really disgusting. This antifreeze up here could have been from when I pulled a head off, but it also might have just been here for a really long time. Well, we just pulled the number eight cap and uh, the crank spins freely now. Mystery solved. <laughs> what are your eyes, magnets? They never melt. They never, it's not stopping. That's like brake fluid. That's, yeah. yeah, Marvel mystery oil to the eye is bad too, I guess. Are you drinking the water or flushing your eyes? My eye. Here's a sample of what's raining out of the timing cover. Notice the different colors and stuff? I think what's happening is the timing cover is corroding to bits. But there's like other stuff in there. Yeah, this is kind of awesome, actually. In a really disgusting and horrifying way. There is stud pulling marks through all of that. This has already been done once. And it got smashed again. Really Oh, yeah, now the Bondo's is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's Bondo. No, these rust out really bad there. Don't touch that. Should I smash the windshield? Well, now that the cab is fully restored to factory condition, I guess we'll get back to the engine. Look at all the horrible surface rusty crusty stuff on the number eight rod. Number seven, if you could see that. Yeah, the same. But they're moving free now, so I'm gonna say it's okay. Oh, also, just so we're all clear on how stuff works, see that oil in there on the bearing surface? That nice film of admittedly kind of gross oil that's still in place, despite this thing sitting for like a decade or two or three. Just saying, pre-lube doesn't really do much for your bearings here. This piston just really doesn't like moving up and down at all. So I just took a hone to the top of the board to try and clean that up and knock the ridge down a bit. And we're gonna take it out, see if we can fix it, if it wants to cooperate. How you doing down there? Wonderful. But is it still raining in your eye? They're closed, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> this seems fine, doesn't it? I think it's fine. So this is really weird, because there's no major rust or anything, but with number seven and eight pistons in the engine, the engine just kind of doesn't roll right. Hey, what's that? Okay, now the mystery is solved. That ring's broken and like stacked on top of itself. Wow. Yeah, there's the brake and the ends just overlapped. That's really cool. I gave seven a quick dingle ball hone and the crank does roll now, but there's still a good bit of resistance. So that's gonna come back out. With seven and eight out, this thing turns like butter. What a horrible mess we've made. And interesting smells too. Did we burn like a whole day on this? Yes. I think it's time for a cheeseburger. This chunk of semi-clean, semi-shiny paint is just getting me way too excited. It's the day after Dave and I got the 
poly engine in the 64 power wagon turnable, kind of, and learned some things. And I wanted to give you a closer look at this, the number eight piston. This was our big problem with a secondary problem in uh, number seven. Now there's a bunch of grit all over this, but that's from me honing the top of the cylinder, trying to knock the ridge down so this would come out because initially it wouldn't. The first hint that something's amiss here is well, that humongous gap that doesn't belong and the shiny ends of the ring. Judging by how that looks, this engine ran this way, possibly for a while. Somehow the ends of the ring did weird stuff. It's broken and like wedged over itself. So that's not so good. I think the ring land in there is damaged too, which is unfortunate because, well, I really need this piston to live. Here's a look at the second ring on number eight. And as you can see, it's jam packed full of horror. Pretty sure moisture did that. That ring's definitely what you would call stuck. Unfortunately, a lot of the rings in this engine are probably gonna look like that. If the top one wasn't broken and we could have gotten this running, you know, might have cleaned itself out. Maybe. So now I'm kind of starting to think I might need to pull all the pistons. Well, most of the ring popped right out. Surprise, surprise, that piece stayed behind. Woo! Oh yeah, pro level. This is so cool. I gotta clean the crap out of this. I actually own a ring groove cleaner, but one of the chunks of broken rings is great. Look at all the crap coming out of there. I'm secretly hoping that because it was only number seven and eight that looked all crusty and horrible like this, the rest of the pistons and rings are fine. Okay, so the ring groove's not really ideal. Yeah. Whoops! Oh, why would you do that? Hey, don't like drop or throw your pistons. That's a bad idea. Anyway, uh, ring groove's kind of goofed up, but I think I'm just gonna pretend it's not. The ring's still stuck, so let's see if it wants to become unstuck. I'm gonna have to set my toolbox on fire. We're gonna stay pulled way back here so you can't see how bad I screwed this piston up. Let's just say it's worse than when I started, but I finally got that ring coming out, also in pieces. I was doing good here. Everything was going great. Until, uh, until it wasn't really going great anymore. So, yep, time to walk away. You might be wondering at this point why I don't just pull this engine out. Dave asked me this several times yesterday, as well as asking well, why we couldn't just put an LA in it. Listen, I'm committed. But uh, as I told him, if the engine comes out, it's never going back in. So we'll just fix it here. Luckily, I've got some friends in the swept line business. So instead of like tearing apart this perfectly good core engine, I'll just go and visit my friends at Mamvinsky's garage, pick through their scrap pile. Might have to turn this one into a hood ornament or something. <coughs> we'll, uh, we'll save that for later batches. Man, swept lines are cool. Anyway, after all that, I think it's time to relax with a nice cold, Adult beverage <sighs> and some body work. As I'm sure you all know by now, I am an expert metal shaper, so. Look at that. It's coming right back. I do need to get this bend back into it. Wow. It's actually pretty decent. It's, uh, it's probably good enough for who it's for. Probably won't be able to fix that. Well, I could chain it to a stump, but that might work. Ooh, shiny. Ah, what's the worst that could happen? You don't need to answer that question. Well, I guess that's how you do that. Wow, it's still there, barely. And nobody died. There's a dart too, but don't worry about that. Hmm, it's like if my truck was like 800 times nicer. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay, look at that. With some much needed help from the neighbor the other day, I got that horrible thing off and I got the step side bed set in place. And immediately I realized I'd made a mild tactical error. This is what you get when you set a late bed on an early truck. Now I already knew that, 
because I've done it before. But for some reason, I thought it would just work out. So it's not exactly the most ideal, but well, I'm getting excited anyway. Now, there are a few different ways of dealing with this. Like I could go try and find a bed that actually fits, but that's way too much work. I could move the axle. My friends Nick and Scott over at Lamvinci's Garage did this recently with a 68 chassis to make it match a 64 body, and it turned out really nicely. They just drilled the rivets out, scooted the axle forward so the rear rivets were in the front rivet position, then drilled new holes. I don't want to do that. For one thing, it's way too much work. For another thing, I like the shorter wheelbase. Better maneuverability, you know. So the other option is modifying this bed. I'll have to take like four inches out of it right here. Maybe a little bit more. Basically, I think I'd knock all the spot welds out of the stake pocket, cut the rail, cut a new square into it, move the stake pocket, cut the bedside, and then figure out something to do with the step. As it turns out, these frame rails have actually been shortened anyway, so I feel like this approach makes sense. Now this rear cross member in the bed doesn't actually sit on the frame, it sort of hovers around the end of it. That part doesn't really matter, but it's pretty far away as it is. I don't think I'll ever use this nutso home-built trailer hitch thing again, but if I wanted to throw a bolt through it to drag stuff around with a strap, that might be hard to do with a bed overhanging it by 10 inches. And the cab smashed in on both sides. Maybe I should try and fix that. Don't think it'll be hard. You know, all of this is kind of a moot point with the engine still in pieces, isn't it? Well, I've got news on that front too. Because while I was over at Lambinsky's garage, drooling over that beautiful 64 power wagon, they gave me these. These appear to be factory size poly pistons with brand new never run rings on them. Sure, there's some light surface rust, but I'm not going to worry about that. Look, the floater pins actually move. These pistons were actually reconditioned for a poly engine in a different power wagon they have, which I also want to buy. Shocking, I know. Oh no, I just noticed this one's cracked. I think I'm going to pretend I didn't. Uh, maybe they're all cracked. Ooh. <sighs> All right, well, we're learning things about polys. Oh, the power wagon. What do you get when you start a project and then, like, get distracted and or bored partway through? You get this, and it's not ideal. It's been almost a year since I bought this truck, and it's still in pieces, which is terrible. Now that's not to say I haven't done anything. Well, okay, I haven't done much. I did get this set of pistons and rods and rings, and I managed to find a poly full engine gasket set in the back room at Rocket, so that's exciting. You can't just go to the store and buy most of this stuff anymore, so yeah, that was a big win. The unfortunate thing that happened is I broke one of the stones on my hone and I haven't managed to replace it yet. Well, and you know, there's also like 10,000 other projects, so that's part of it. Hmm. All right. Oh yeah, I even got a new exhaust manifold for it. I have every intention of finishing this project. I'll clean this thing up. It'll be fine, but uh, yeah, it's not happening today or any day soon. Really, I need to fix it because I guess I'm going from two power wagons to one. Yeah, don't yell at me, I know. Oh look, another giant project. I probably should have just left the flatbed on it, huh? At least it's better than when I started. Slightly. In some ways, kind of. Aww. Oh, don't pick at the scab. Yeah. I'm still dead set on getting this truck running. I really want to drive it. And I really want to like bounce it off some trees or something. Someone else definitely already did, so it's not like it's going to get any worse. I had every intention of holding out on releasing a video on this truck until the engine like ran, but yeah, it's just not going to happen. So here you go. Why are they all like this? Give me your thoughts here. What would you do if you had this truck? Would you swap the way better but not as turquoisey cab onto it? 
Would you lift it to the moon and put tractor tires under it? Would you fix the steering? Would you push it into the scrapyard and give it the burial it probably deserves at this point? Huh, I just noticed it only came with one visor from the factory. That's cool. Anyway, we'll get back to this at some point in the future. Until then, thank you very much for watching. And remember, sure, the rust sucks, but at least there's a lot of it.